Great to be here talking with you all. I'm Alex. Um, I'm a lawyer. Uh, the way you know I'm a lawyer is I'm going to tell you what I say today are my own personal opinions, uh, not those of anybody that employs me or anybody I've represented in the past, present, or future. Um, I, uh, I'm one of a small number, I guess, of BCI lawyers in some ways. I was a general counsel of Neuralink for two years, a month, three weeks, and a day, but who's counting? Um, and uh, nowadays, I represent a couple of BCI companies, including Science Corporation, which is, uh, does ocular implants and some other things, Integral Neurotechnologies, if you know them. They're around floating around somewhere. So I'm going to talk about sort of law and policy stuff. This is a, this is a somewhat opinionated um, sort of summary of what's going on and just some of my own thoughts on this after doing this for about five years. So I call this law the brain, sort of jokingly. There was, um, there was a debate back in the 90s um, where a US judge named Frank Easterbrook wrote an article called Cyber Law and the Law of the Horse. And then another lawyer named Larry Lessig sort of responded. And the debate had to do with what do you do when you need to make laws for a new technology, which sort of happens a lot because making law is often slow and it's often hard to change once you've, ch once you've made it. And so you want to do it carefully. It's also not very good at keeping up with the pace of technology, hopefully. So you want to do it carefully. Um, and the argument of law of the horse sort of goes like this. So I just sort of wanted to get this argument out to the community because I think it's still a very relevant one. And it's basically like this. You could pass a bunch of what, the first time you see a horse, you might be like, we should pass a bunch of laws about horses. Like what vitamins can you put in them and how, how do you sell them and some regulation of horse shows. But there's not really a coherent body of called like law of the horse. That is not a good way to do laws. What you should instead do is have laws in things that are like conceptually important and make sense and coherent. And then they apply to lots of stuff. They can apply to horses, they can apply to cars, they can apply to people on bicycles. If the speed limit is 50, it can sort of be technology agnostic. The, really, the real question is like, be safe and go the right speed. And so when the internet sort of became popular, this happened a bunch because we, we had laws that I, like my personal view of some of these laws is that they didn't make a lot of sense. One of the famous ones is called the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is essentially like anti-hacking laws. Because the idea is like, well, you already have a law against stealing. So like stealing with a computer doesn't necessarily need to be a new law. We, we had a panic. We had like a moral panic. People got scared. Um, they watched some movies about hackers, like with Matthew Broderick. And then they like passed some laws. And those laws um, sit around um, you know, like a weapon on the mantelpiece uh, for potential misuse. And so you know, eventually the law that Aaron Schwartz was charged under was the CFAA, and one might say it was a bad idea to have passed this law in the first place, partly because it can be, it ha the more laws you have, the more potential for misapplication you have in them. So that's one side of it. And I, in some ways, think this is possibly true for BCI as well. It's like, it's novel, it is very interesting, it triggers a visceral response in people that we have an unmediated set of connections with the brain, with the seat of consciousness, and it makes us feel all kinds of things. It makes lawmakers feel all kinds of things. It makes the pop populace feel all kinds of things. So it's very tempting to like get ahead of it and legislate and make some laws. Um, and, and so part of my thought is like we should probably think about BCI in terms of like what laws do we actually need and what is going to foster development and what's going to allow this field to develop. Well. Very quickly, I have like three personal. By the way, there's another side to that story. I just didn't put it up because I agree with it less. But in fairness, there's a side that says like no, there's certain laws that when they have a, a, a type of emer emergent property that you really do need to have special laws because there's ways that they interact with the laws of nature, the laws of physics, or they put us in a new position where because of scale or you know, computational power or other things, we really do need a new law. It, is, it really is special. You know, it's not just like no murdering, also no murdering with a steak knife. It's, you know, there's something about the modality or the instrumentality that's like unique to this technology. Okay, so this is just my opinion, right? Which is not a real thing. But in my experience, I've, like come, I've come across three types of areas that I think are gonna be important legally with BCI. And it's useful not to confuse them. Um, thing one is that there's a lot of like mundane, good old-fashioned laws that are going to affect the way that we create and manufacture and sell, distribute, whatever, BCI. Not sure they're going to be that interesting to non-lawyers, but it's good to acknowledge them and understand how they might need to change. So I, I put in this category, for example, um, the fact that most semiconductor manufacturers don't like you implanting things in the human body. Um, that's not a law, that's like a contractual preference that exists right now in human history. But um, nevertheless, if we don't change that norm and that set of legal uh, uh, preferences that exist, we're going to have a hard time doing enough implants. So, so maybe that's mundane. There's also areas where intellectual property, again, this is not 
new under the sun, but um, if we have a Apple-Samsung-like patent war um, over very broad BCI patents, we're going to have a very different history of this field than one where we have thoughts about what a commons like might look like or a public domain or like what different um, monetization strategies and intellectual property um, norms are going to be useful for this field, um, seeing as how it's sort of hybrid at this moment, medical and potentially someday consumer. So that's thing one. Thing two is, I think these are the things that like get people excited, where they're like, oh my god, we need a new law. And this often relates to privacy, right? It relates to like the uniqueness or the sui generousness of brain data, that it has a special unmediated access to the brain because of the way that technology works. Um, private things like privacy. And it's always possible that there are unique things about any new technology, but I sort of diagnostically like to remember like, often there are things that are sort of like intensifications or, or recapitulations of things that are not actually unique. And they might cast existing things in a new light, but they aren't necessarily new in a way that requires us to change course. So I, I sort of usually phrase this as like, maybe provocatively, as like maybe everybody worries too much about BCI and too little about their phones, right? Like a lot of the privacy harms that people are very scared about with, with this unmediated access to brain data and neural data is potentially sort of already existing if you have really good phone data and maybe really good facial recognition data. And so I'm not saying people aren't freaking out enough, but it's like people might be viscerally freaking out because of this um, sense of, uh, you know, you might either say an understandable visceral um, horror or like sentimentality about the human body, depending on how you think of it, um, that leads us to think about it in a non-analytical non way. Um, um, on, the, on the other hand, it's good that people wake up and have a visceral feeling of like, wow, we're putting electrodes in the brain, there should be a law. But it might cause us to want other laws that don't just affect BCI. It might just cause us to rethink like what it is that data does in the first place. And of course, we should try not to panic. Panic is bad. Um, you know, and there's always folks in the world who will uh, exploit panic in various ways to their own, their own agendas, and you know, that, that's probably not what we want for the field or for society. And then the third thing is like a thing that's very interesting to lawyers again, but possibly not to folks here, but may maybe it is. And I call this, this is sort of like stuff in the law that is very tied to your mental state that then when you put a new uh, technology about cognition into the world, it sort of changes the way that that stuff looks. So for example, you know, obviously when you uh, have a trial and you do a, a, a law thing and you have a trial and like somebody murdered somebody, one of the things you ask is like, what was their intent, right? Do they really mean to do it? What were they thinking when they pulled the trigger? And you spend a lot of time thinking about intent, intentionality, and do they have you know, criminal mind? Well, every time a new technology comes out that purports to tell us new things about the human mind, it is always tempting to take it to court for show and tell and like see what we can do to the legal system. And so obviously, like the way that I talk about this is like I this is the thing that I think we want to do with a lot of caution. You know, we possibly should have been more careful about the polygraph. Um, we should be very careful about the way that we introduce BCI into the legal system and what it does when it um, purports to tell us about people's meaningful mental states. It's a very interesting like philosophical field, but it's one of these areas where I guess I advocate for a lot of conservatism. Okay, and let me just talk about some, some existing laws and like what, what we, just, just so you like, you know, if you don't hear about it from me, you'll pick it up on the streets. So talk about ex <laughs> existing, existing privacy law. Um, so in some sense, we're already there. Like the GPR, that, that European law, the General Data Protection Regulation, already has a biometric data category. And it's sort of like personal data. Blah, blah, blah. The, the thing I would say about data, and I know all of you dactyloscope enthusiasts out there are like, damn it, my dactyloscope is going to get me in trouble. But basically, um, <laughs> right, and, and that's actually a nice example, I think, of like how technologies get calcified into a particular moment when some lawmaker is aware of it. But okay, dactyloscopes being like fingerprint detection technology. Um, that we, GDPR is already for a little bit from another era, like it or, or not, because it really is about identification of a person. It doesn't really get into a lot of the mental states and a lot of the um, um, cognitive um, things that people are concerned about. The GDPR is potentially a tool, good or bad, that will be used to limit the flow of data, including neural data, but it doesn't seem to be as philosophically interested at its moment in like some of the issues that that come up that are deeper. So let me, let me just talk about a few other laws because it's interesting what's out there. There's this funny law called BIPA that Illinois passed back in 2008 and that recently got amended. I only mention BIPA because, not because not I want to be like, haha, but because um, it's been used for, it's, it's, a, it's a good example of a well-intentioned law that partly, um, what, what it did was basically in Illinois said like, you know, if you're gonna manipulate people's biometric data, defines biometric data this way, 
retina iris scans, fingerprints, voice prints. You need to take extra care. You need to get extra consent. You need to do a bunch of extra stuff. Sat there unused for about 10 years. And then enterprising plaintiff's lawyers, bless them, bless us, um, weaponized it and brought a lot of lawsuits, um, including Facebook and Snapchat, employers, supermarkets, anybody who used fingerprints to have people clock into work, anybody who used face, um, you know, pictures on, you know, to, for facial scan, and got a bunch of money. I think one of the lessons of BIPA was that like, the, it's, a, it's, an, it's an embodiment of this point I was talking about earlier, which is like, when you pass a law and get super excited about a new technology, you potentially create a loaded weapon. And so that law about a month ago got amended because they were like, okay, this is actually bad and companies are getting sued and they didn't really do anything wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, if you're like an industry show like me, you're always gonna say that. But nevertheless, like the, the idea was that this was not imbalance. Um, this created a big sledgehammer and creating big sledgehammers is nice, but what you really want is like more precise sledgehammers, not bigger sledgehammers because the amount of money that was at stake was really large. Um, so interesting case of a law, and I also raise it because as I said, you pass a law, fine, good for you, this one took 15 or 16 years to get amended, so you're potentially stuck with it for a while. So, so it bears being careful. BIPA is just interesting. One little, one other little footnote on BIPA that I thought was interesting. Like, one of the class actions was against Snapchat um, for for biometric processing against the lenses feature. If you all remember that one, where you like use it and it make you look like something, um, <laughs> it was something not you, something cooler than you. Um, but when, but when you uh, used lenses, if you remember this, there was a moment where we were like, do like a geometric pattern over your face that I, that I would say was like really an aesthetic thing probably invented by a designer that's like science is happening. Um, and it's not really clear that the data that Snap was using to do lenses should be biometric data under the strict definition. It's really just a picture that they altered. But in my personal view of that, of that litigation, part of how they got screwed was that when you show like a jury that like facey thing, they're just like science. Um, and, and I think that's sort of uh, like I joke about it, but I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting lesson because I would, I would first state it like this. Sometimes when you aestheticize science or you deploy technology or science aesthetically, you wind up with odd and unintended consequences because people sort of take it literally. So in that case, like it was not biometric, but it had a sort of like computer enhanced biometrics vibe to it. And that vibe had real world, including legal consequences. So it's just, it's an interesting, I think, example from that, from that era. Settlement was, I think, 35 million bucks. Every Snapchat lens user got 13 bucks. So, victory. Um, the Chilean, Chile has gotten ahead on this. The Chilean constitution actually added a provision to their constitution, uh, the Chilean government did, uh, on sort of neural data. Um, and I just sort of figured I'd put it up because it's interesting. Um, and it's in some ways incredibly aspirationally idealistic and great scientific technological development will be at the service of people We carried out with respect for life and physical and mental integrity while we'll regulate the requirements conditions and restrictions for its use by people we must especially protect brain activity as well as the information from it. So it's like Pretty pretty wild to have a constitution specifically addressing brain data at this point and There's been one sort of lawsuit um, on this since that uh, there's also implementing laws and so this company emotive if you all know them um, had to delete a bunch of data as a result. Uh, you know, not declaring victory or, or uh, I guess, I guess what, what can we say about this? It's a good example of wanting to get ahead, of, ahead on an issue or of like activists for, for good and bad intention or for, say for good intentions, wanting to enshrine something at a high level of abstraction and idealism that sets forth like sort of the ethical and human principles by which um, the, the more specific and articulated laws are gonna, are gonna deal with brain data. Um, you know, it's also subject, I would say, to one of my usual criticisms that it's like something will be at the service of people, will be carried out with respect for life, physical, and mental integrity. It's like, I, I read a book this morning that like didn't respect my mental integrity very well. It's, 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 but, but okay, like constitutions are supposed to be like aspirational and very broad. And so this definitely is a, is a flag that has been planted that can, is, you know, could be potentially very interesting later. Very possible that other, um, you know, folks in Latin America are going to get interested in this. Um, places like Brazil that are that are similarly interested. Um, Colorado, so Colorado um, sort of passed the first, uh, I would say, BCI law about a month ago. They really, what they really did was they amended their existing privacy law. But I'm just going to round that up and call it a BCI law. 
um, because they added neural data to the existing privacy law. Um, and they defined it. So part of a lot of the action in this is like, how are you going to define the thing, right? Information that is generated by the measurement of the activity of individual peripheral nervous system can be processed by or with the assistance of a device. Pretty good. And we can like sort of, I, you know, we can like chew this over for a while. It, one, one of the things that always strikes me about this exercise in attempting to define the, the, the coverage of these laws, um, you know, as like a legal engineer and as a drafter, is that, again, information generated by the measurement of the activity of an individual can be processed by or with, can be processed. So you don't need a device to process it. It's basically any information generated from the measurement of the activity. So it's maybe most dangerous and most relevant and most um, relevant at scale when you're measuring brain data, but also like noting like your spouse's moods on an index card theoretically falls under this law. Um, like the same way that like GDPR, if you, if you keep notes on your employees and throw it into a filing cabinet, that also violates the GDPR potentially. So there's a lot of times like, I know this goes against exactly what I said earlier, which is like when you draft tech agnostically, that's good because it doesn't sort of calcify the current state of the art into the law in bad ways. But when you draft really abstractly, you wind up capturing all sorts of things with, with very little way of knowing what it is that's gonna be swept up um, into the dragnet or not. Um, Including, I would say, um, si similar to the Snapchat thing, that if you have something that is sort of like apparently technological or apparently related to, the, um, to something that has a scientific phenomenon, um, uh, it has a sort of like, uh, uh, it's sort of, you can sort of fudge it in a way that a good lawyer will fudge it. And what I, what I mean by that is, um, uh, when I say like the aesthetic use of scientific jargon, there was a moment after like the 2016 election where folks in like, social media and disinformation and other fields that I do a bunch of work in, started using the word dopamine a lot because we had like learned it and we were just like, you stimulated my dopamine. Um, and you know, and it was like, I like hugged my child, stimulated my dopamine, like, you know, and oxytocin. And so like, what, what I mean is like, yes, of course, you can describe lots of things in a scientific register and sometimes that is very useful for doing it analytically and consistently and with rigor in the way that we do science things, but you can also use it to atmospherically make something sound more or less dangerous, more or less interesting, more or less anything. And so I always keep an eye out for this like atmospheric and aesthetic introduction of scientific concepts into the law in ways that are potentially gonna um, have unexpected consequences later. So if you think about this like, you know, we need laws about things that are like stimulating dopamine in, un, you know, in unforeseen quantities. And it's like, it's basically just a way of saying like, don't have too much fun or like, you know, don't make stuff that's super fun, um, but hard to get that law passed. But like, don't don't make dopamine machines very. So, I'll, I'll stop making fun of it. But I think it's just like it it um, it introduces, I think, to a largely non-legal audience some of the challenges of legal engineering, which is like drafting in a manner that is precise and doesn't um, then cause a lot of these later unintended consequences. And all of us are going to be um, uh, dealing with the consequences of the decisions that legislators are making right now for for a good long while. Um, one or two more things. By the way, feel free to break in um, with questions. Um, UNESCO released a thing in the last month. It's always interesting when like the UN gets involved. And um, so they released like a 34-page um, report on ethical principles on BCI. Um, it's an interesting document, and I sort of recommend it to folks. It's free. It's on their website. And I just wanted to like briefly go over at a high level some of the things it says. It's a. It's a. It's a good example of a bunch of thoughtful people trying to put some markers down of what it is we're going to do about this technology. But see, I've sort of split them into different buckets. And so starting maybe from the bottom, like some of the risks of BCI, inequality. It's like, yes, all technology, inequality, absolutely, will be un potentially unequally distributed. Uses more resources than we want because of electricity. Ma made me wonder for a second if it was an anti-Bitcoin paper rather than a BCI paper. But you're like, okay, nowadays everything uses more electricity potentially than we want it to. And these are just sort of like, I would say, generic technology concerns. And they're welcome and they're important, but then also they're, they're not very specific to, this, to the challenges of BCI. Um, risk of stigmatization based on neural data and coercive use. I think those get at the core of what I was calling bucket two earlier. Things that are um, not unique to BCI, but... Um, but things where you have um, scientific, you have neural data, and it can tell you things about either people's mental states, people's mental conditions, people's medical conditions, and it's gonna be traveling out there in the world. 
Um, convergence with AI was one of them. I guess it's sort of like the two things we're afraid of are talking to each other. Um, but but it's but also valid that um, you know the convergence of AI use of machine learning with BCI technologies potentially will get ahead of us very quickly. And we're not going to be sure what happens, especially in a closed loop environment where you're sort of reaffecting um, pe people's you know, people's brains. Um, our old friend algorithmic bias, um, risk to quote unquote mental privacy. Not clear what mental privacy is exactly legally, but seems like it's privacy, but also something more, sort of your interiority or this last retreating vestige of the pre-scientific you know, self and soul. But whatever mental privacy gets eventually defined as, um, it's at risk. Um, I, I actually find this interesting because I think the attempts to define privacy like philosophically and legally are so, sort of like on two different paths right now and they rarely intersect. But like mental privacy, I think, is one of the rare moments where, where it's like, Privacy law is often about like data transfer. Did you get consent? How many cookies are you using? Like not really stuff that makes you think about privacy in the classical sense. Whereas you know, a lot of philosophical query privacy is sort of like the seat of the self, the interiority, your, you know, your backstage, the part of your brain that is not exposed to, the part of your mind that is not exposed to public scrutiny, et cetera. So maybe the rubber is going to need to meet the road more um, on those two sort of lines of inquiry and these ethical principles. Um, I'll maybe skip the rest because I don't know how important. You know, incentivizing misconduct in the field. This will, you know, m making consumer devices that are neurotech might incentivize people to commit misconduct. Yeah, sure, okay, but like enforce, enforce the laws we have. We might damage nervous systems. Sure, we might. Um, uh, interesting question. Everything is around sort of people. Um, the cognitive liberty sort of line of thinking on this has been very much in the pro privacy discourse of like people have a right to not have their minds manipulated. We have a right to know what is acting on our brains. We have a right to know where our data is going to wind up. And that's, I think, a very understandable and reasonable line of thinking. I think the line of uh, self-sovereignty that does not get underscored as much in that is the, like, why can't I experiment on myself part? Um, and so I've just, I would just throw a flag down there that it's interesting that a lot of the cognitive liberty like literature out there, in my view, is very interested in pro-regulation, pro-state pro intervention, pro like pro, I would say, like um, you know, paternalism, as opposed to the more libertarian view of cognitive liberty, which is like, let's find a way to do this that doesn't set um, hard, reg hard regulations prohibiting individuals from doing stuff. So unless that changes, I think we can ex sort of expect that road to go down. And I think there's a good reason for that. I'll get to in a minute, but um, cool. OK, one or two more. And I'll, okay. So now my last slide, and then I'll take some questions. So what have I learned from doing this for a couple of years? So I think, think one is like, don't panic. Um, Generally a good rule, but um, the government works slowly. I think for a lot of folks in this room, that's an annoyance, understandably. But sometimes it's good when it works slowly. Um, when you're passing a new law, you should probably think about it a bunch. Um, a lot of folks right now are like, let's get ahead of this. I think a lot of folks who live through social media wars, I mean legislators and regulators who live through the social media wars, who've lived through the CDA 230 wars over internet liability, um, when, it came, when it comes to AI right now, and when it comes to BCI, my experience talking with folks in Washington is that they're like, not this time, Satan. Like, we are passing the laws first. Um, and it's sort of understandable um, function of the history we're all living in, but it's a good thing to understand about this context and how to figure out how to not foment this and not, you know, not talk about these technologies in a way publicly that is going to um, foment that panic. Um, on that note, I'll just leave you, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lawyer expression. I work a lot with technologists who reason from quote unquote first principles. Um, and, and I'm sure they, they really do, but there's an expression among lawyers, um, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Um, which is to say you're not exempt from history. And the development of AI and the development of BCI is going to be very dependent on the last 15 years of what happened with internet and social media law and legislation. and the public's feelings and a lot of legislators' feelings about how the tech industry has behaved, whether they're right or wrong. And so I think it's, it's useful to come to the conversation with that understanding. Not, again, not that we need to repeat the same mistakes again, but that we need to, to be cognizant of that. OK, be careful about law of the horse. Yeah, for the same reasons I said, don't, don't do law of the horse stuff, or at least be careful before you do it. Functional drafting can be over and under inclusive. If you, if you draft like functionally, meaning, like I said, uh, uh, you, using scientific jargon as an aesthetic, you potentially create laws that are 
either capture too much behavior or capture too little behavior, have technical people help. Um, the lessons we learn from BCI may be applicable to other areas, so maybe what we learn from BCI is really that we should change laws related to phones. Um, the one last thing I want to throw out is, is it workable to build a consent-based regime in areas where people don't really know everything or can't be expected to know them? This is sort of current, thing, current conundrum of privacy law, which is like, people are like, control your data. Have you control? You should control it. You should know what's going on. Absolutely, you should know what's going on. You should control it. You should have insight into your data. But a, a lot of privacy harms are, by their nature, collective action problems. And a lot of them are, are definitionally sort of beyond the knowledge and understanding of a layperson. And so making our entire legal regime based on the knowledge, the, the knowing consent of a non-expert might lead us down a pretty bad path because there's things they're not going to be able to fully understand and consent to. And then we've sort of built the whole building on something pretty fragile. Um, and a whole other thing I wanted to talk about that I'll skip, except to say that I think we should revisit the concept of ownership, which is to say, when you had physical goods, you would own a book, you would own a CD, you could resell it. You, you, you did not have, people did not have the ability to brick a book from a central server. You did not have the ability to brick your CD from a central server. Now, as we've been ushered towards streaming and other licensing regimes where um, because of firmware updates and because of subscription models, thing, um, you know, our, things that we own are, are licensed from a central controller. Um, probably BCI is a great chance to get back to this principle of like once you have an implant in your head, maybe you should be allowed to fully own it and not just like license it and have it bricked remotely. I feel kind of strongly about this one, so happy to talk to folks more about it. And uh, yeah, I hope this is instructive. Thank you.